what Satan knows about the will of God that most Christians don't. Now, before we get into this message, I just have a couple of quick things I want to say. First of all, thank you so much for your participation, your comments, your donations. It's all very helpful and very much appreciated. Also, I need you to know that I am not on WhatsApp. Somebody has been going in on a WhatsApp and saying, text me for more teaching. That is not me. Okay, I am not on WhatsApp. I tried to block it in the studio, but in case one slips by, just know it's not me. Okay, thirdly, please remember to like and to share. Likes are free. Okay, if you would say, I struggle to know the will of God. I want to know his will without a doubt, without any hesitation, without any reluctance. Let's talk about that. There is nothing that is more important to God than for you to know his will and to act upon it. God does not want his will to be a secret or a mystery to his own children. The world cannot know the will of God, but for us who are born again, it is our privilege to know and to act upon the will of God. When Jesus was in the earth, his main focus was the will of God. He said, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And Jesus says to us that if any man wants to be my disciple, he must lay down his life, take up his cross and follow me. So we follow the same path that Jesus took. We come down to serve him. In other words, everything about our old life points to self, our sin, our pride, our attitudes, our desires, our will. That is what we serve. But when we come to Christ, we lay down our old lives. We lay it all down at his feet. Nowadays, beloved, we hear messages that tell us what we can be. Okay, what we can be and what we can accomplish if we just come to Jesus. And people come to Jesus. They answer altar calls with vision boards inscripted in their hearts and minds. And it has their will and their desires and their dreams tattooed on their hearts and minds. And they come saying, God, can you do this for me? Can you launch my real estate business for me? Can you give me a dream house? Can you make me a famous rapper or singer? If they come into the church without a dream, the church will show them one. And then they see the pastor and they want to be like him. Or they see a prophetess and they want to be like her. Or they see someone operating in the gift of healing and they want that power. And all of this without ever laying down their lives. And beloved, what the enemy knows is that a person who will not lay down their life will serve their flesh and their own will. And so they will serve their lust, their sin, their pride. But that's not all. They will also serve their guilt and their shame and their fears, and their worries, and their anxieties, and their emptiness. Because all of these are of the flesh. And they will be praying, God, deliver me from my worries. Deliver me from my anxieties. Deliver me from my fears. But you can only be delivered from that if you lay down your life. You can't fragment the flesh, beloved. You can't hold on to the fleeting pleasures of the flesh. And expect the parts of the flesh that you don't want to be taken away. It doesn't work that way. You lay down your life and God takes it all away and gives you new life. He takes your sin. He takes your lusts. He takes your fears. He takes your anxieties and your old desires. He takes your will and your worries. And this is something that Satan knows. But he will try to deceive believers into thinking that you can just keep your old life and pray your fears away or pray your anxieties away 
or your worries. But no, you if you don't lay down your life, those things aren't going anywhere. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, humble yourselves, therefore, before God's mighty hand, so that in due time, he will exalt you. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And so it's the surrender. When we surrender to God, it's the death of the flesh. Jesus said, lay down your life, take up your cross and follow me. And, you know, the enemy has lied to people. You will hear people say, you know, I've always struggled financially. That's my cross to bear. That's not your cross to bear. The cross has never meant anything other than death. So when Jesus is saying, take up your cross and follow me, he is calling for the death of that old life. He is calling for the death of that flesh. To the generation that Christ spoke to, they understood what that meant. But now, somehow, it has taken on a new meaning, but it does not have a new meaning. It means what it means, and it means death to the flesh. And the flesh not only doesn't want to surrender, beloved, it is so full of pride and sin and stubbornness that it doesn't know how to surrender. It really does not have the capability of surrendering, which is why it has to die. We surrender our minds to God. We surrender our will, our emotions, our intellect, our reasoning. We surrender this to God. But the flesh has to die. It will not surrender. You literally have to, by faith, deny the flesh. And yes, it will suffer. It will suffer, but you gain Christ. And this is God's will for you, that you gain Christ. In Philippians 3, verse 8, Paul writes, talking about his old life. You know, he was a Pharisee. He was a leader in Judaism. And he was a well-respected leader. And he said, whatever was gained to me, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. He said, more than that, I count all things as dung compared to the surpassing excellence of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. And be found in him. You want to be found in him. You want God to find you in Christ. You want the enemy when he comes to attack, to deceive, to find you in Christ. He says, not having my own righteousness that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God on the basis of faith. The apostle Paul writes, I no longer live. But Christ lives in me, and the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave his life for me. In the late 80s and, and early 90s, all of a sudden there seemed to be this explosive desire with Christians wanting theology degrees and wanting degrees in biblical studies and so on. And I'm not against any education, but it's not a substitute for laying down your life. It's not a substitute for the school of the Holy Spirit. Building a ministry is not a substitute for laying down your life. See, this is the way that the enemy has deceived people. You know, he has literally made people think that, well, you start a ministry, you start a church, you know, you serve in this way or that way, you start a women's center, you know, ministry, whatever, and that is your life laid down. No, it's not. No, it's not. You know, this is why church is in the condition it's in, where leaders are, are being exposed and falling like dominoes because you lay down your life and you allow God to resurrect the new man and to use you according to his will, not our will. One thing that Christians have to really be cautious of is that desire can feel like God. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Desire can feel like God. Do you know why there is such little joy 
and peace and happiness among Christians? Because true happiness is godliness. Oh yes, true happiness is righteousness. It's not houses and cars and money. It's Christ. It's Christ being your portion forever. It's knowing he is with you. It's knowing that you are never alone. It's knowing that God will be with you even until your old age and your gray hair. Happiness, joy, peace is knowing Christ. It's not earthly treasure. It's God hearing and answering your prayers. It's God giving you the peace of heart and mind that you desire. It's God causing you to rest and to sleep at night. Oh, yes. It's God strengthening you to walk through the storms of life, upholding you with his right hand of righteousness for his name's sake. Beloved, this is true joy. This is happiness. It's God sometimes carrying you through the storm. It's God speaking a word to you that changes the times and the season that you're in. Beloved, it's God. It's God himself. It's being in a relationship with God. It's our heavenly father. He is our joy. Oh, yes. He is our joy. He is our reward. God himself is our treasure. But it's lacking in the church because the enemy has managed to keep Christians from laying down their life and they end up being a servant to their fears and being a servant to their anxiety and a servant to their worries. The enemy knows who we are. Oh yes, he knows if you are in Christ or not. You know, when the sons of Sceva tried to cast out demons, the, the devil said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? He did not recognize them. They were not found in Christ. The reason that people's peace ends at one o'clock on Sunday, it ends right along with the benediction of the worship service. When is the last time that your peace lasted way past the worship service? The enemy has lied to Christians and has used pulpits to do it. Oh yes, oh yes. He has made them believe that God's blessing is earthly treasure. That cars and houses and land is evidence of God's being pleased with you and God blessing you. Beloved, if you read the Bible, you will know better. We know better than this. We know this is not true. We know better than this. Because when the enemy tempted Jesus... What did he offer Jesus? The glory of the world. The glory of the world. So do you think that God is the only one that is giving out houses and cars and businesses and wealth? He absolutely is not. And if God gives it, it's purposeful. It's not to consume it upon your lust. It's to accomplish his will. And of course, God wants you to use what you need to live. But primarily, it is to accomplish the will of God, not to consume upon your lust. But the reason that people want these things is because they don't have Christ. Because they have not attained Christ. You know, Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a man who finds a pearl in a field and goes out and sells everything that he has and buys the whole field. When you attain Christ, you're found in him, beloved, the appetite for those things is so small. It really doesn't matter if you ever have them because you have Christ and your arch enemy has so many Christians ensnared in this ideology that it's all about what God can give you. Jesus said, those who lose their life for my sake will find it. But if you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. He said, what does it profit a man? to gain the whole world and to lose his soul. And what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Beloved, there's nothing. There's nothing that you can give to God, not your service, not your theology degree, not your the church you founded, not your title. 
There's nothing you can give to God in exchange for your soul. There is only one name given under heaven whereby men must be saved, and that is Jesus. He alone can save our souls. When people ask me, do you sense what God wants me to do? You know, what God's will is for me? I say, yes, I do sense it. In fact, I prophesy, lay down your life. That's God's will, that you lay down your life along with your ambitions, your dreams, your desires, your longings, and your motives. Lay it down. You know, when I got saved in 1981, I did absolutely nothing in the church except go to church on Sunday, on Wednesday night Bible study, and Friday night radio broadcast. That's all I did. I did absolutely nothing except go to church. And I did that for seven years. For seven years. The mothers of the church, when I got saved, they used to say, sit your butt down and learn. Sit down, learn how to lay down your life. Learn who God is. Learn what God's will is. Learn how to pray. Learn what it is to live holy. Learn what it is to live righteous. Learn how to renew your mind. Learn how to walk in the spirit so you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. But today, people see that as a waste of time. But that is why there's no order, there's no discipleship, and there's no presence in a lot of these churches. No presence of God. Just emotional highs. You want the fire of God? I don't blame you for that. But the fire falls on the sacrifice. If you're not laying down your life for love, others might not know it, but God knows it and you know it. Beloved, this is not something that is easy, nor is it something possible for us. But if you're willing, if you're willing to humble yourself, if you're willing to lay it down, maybe you never laid down your life. Because you didn't know that God desired you to, that, you, that he willed you to. Maybe you laid down your life a long time ago, but you've picked it up again. And now you're facing some of the same struggles that you were in the beginning. Whichever it is, God is calling to you, to you, to lay it down again. Let's pray, Father. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege and the honor of knowing you. Thank you, God, for your son, Jesus, and for being willing to take our old lives, to take the old man, Father, Lord, and to give us new life. Father, we don't know how to lay it all down to lay down our will, our ambitions, our desires, our dreams, our goals. So, Father, I pray for these that would hear this message and whose eyes would open, Lord, and who would acknowledge, Father, that they have picked their lives up again. Or perhaps they never laid it down. Father, thank you for giving them the grace and the will to humble themselves before your mighty hand and to lay down their lives that they might gain Christ. Father, we know that this is your will. And a man who knows your will doesn't need much more than that. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.